Well, how are you doing with your eat this book reading? Eh? You should be, if I'm not mistaken, into 1 Kings, right? Some of y'all are going, 1 Kings? I'm in Genesis still. What are you talking about? (laughs) The challenge is that you read through the whole Bible this year, right? That's the challenge, but that's not the goal. So don't, don't confuse it. The goal is that you are daily in the word of God, allowing it to transform you. That's the goal. So if you have, wherever you are, you're still in Genesis, don't decide to quit. Don't throw in the towel. Maybe you already have. Don't, don't. You can grab another uh, Bible reading program. You can get it at the information desk. You can get it online. You can get it at version, And just start where we are now and just keep going. Keep going with this thing. Now, here's my question, though. How has this, as you've read, I've heard different comments from different people, how has this changed you? What have you learned? What have you gotten out of it? Maybe you have an idea. I've heard someone tell me, you know, I'm not a reader, and so I listen to the Word of God, and that might be be something, or you take notes. So would you, I'm going to invite you to do something. Would you email me, perhaps, just something that you have gotten out of this, or something you have learned, or, or something that has helped you Uh, whatever, that would be wonderful. Perhaps we would even share it on Sunday morning here. So there's my email. You can can email me right now if the the message gets too long or something. Just pull out your phone and go for it. I want to take you this morning on a a trip to Worshipville, USA. Your Worshipville, USA, downtown, corner of 5th and Main, there are four churches on the corners of Worshipville, USA, 5th uh, and Main. You, you've got the first church that we come across on the northeast corner is the Exalted uh, Above All Cathedral, E-A-A-C. Now, E-A-A-C is a very, very high church. Uh, in E-A-A-C, the, the, uh, the architecture, Baroque-style cathedral, but the the only uh, electric instrument they have is this massive pipe organ. And every prelude and offertory and postlude that they play is either written by Bach or Beethoven or, or Mozart. Now the robed choir, led by the robed choir director, when they, they sing, they only sing in Latin, French, or German, never English. The, the congregation will sing contemporary music from time to time, but contemporary in their mind is anything written between 1850 and 1900. Anything written after 1900 does not qualify as music. When the robe passes delivers his 23-minute homily. It is speckled with quotes from Pulitzer Prize winners or, or philosophers. A very intellectually stimulating experience. When you leave EAAC, when the congregation does anyway, they are sure that, that their worship is superior to any other worship in Worshipville, USA. Now, the other people from the other churches, they've got their ideas about EAAC as well. Uh, Bells and smells, stuffy, cold liturgy with no relevance to their life. Now, on the southeast corner, in 5th in Maine at Worshipville, you've got First Traditional Church. And First Traditional is, is traditional. It, it, their, their choir sings Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, and tours the deep south every other year. Uh, they always sing three Fanny Crosby hymns followed by a Gaither chorus. And when Brother Bob delivers his 75-minute sermon from his King James Bible in his three-piece polyester suit, he always ends it with an altar call. And after the service, when the, when the congregation of First Traditional goes to the Cracker Barrel of Fellowship, they are sure that God has, has honored their worship service more than any other worship service in Worshipville, USA. Well, across the street from First Traditional, you've got the new kid on the block, Cozy Creek Community Church. Cozy, they, these guys have got, the, they've got all the bells and, and whistles. As a matter of fact, their largest ministry team in the church is their tech team, second only to their yoga outreach team and their parking team and their latte team. Now, th- these folk never sing a song older than two years. Oh, they just, they just don't do that. And when the pastor comes up to preach, he's wearing tattered jeans, perhaps, and maybe a, a wadded up uh, T-shirt with wrinkles. And he'd preach out of the message. Um, but, but when they go home, you can tell that what they are so sure that God is smiling wider on their worship than any other church's worship in town. Now, the other people in town, they have an idea about Cozy Creek. Uh, 
It smells of consumerism. It's shallow. It's production. It's performance. Uh, God does not like that. That's what everyone else thinks. Now, the fourth church at the corner of, of Fifth and Main in Worshipville is the uh, Pentecost exalted tabernacle of the Holy Ghost power spirit come down. The tab, as they like to call it. And when you go to the tab, you don't just go to church at the tab. You experience church at the tab. I mean, and whatever they sing, they really sing. I mean, that people are swaying and moving, and they got the dancers and the banners going. The, the preacher will begin his sermon and end his sermon when the Holy Spirit says so. The name of the game at the tab is freedom. Whatever you, you feel like you need to be doing, whether it's stand up or sit down or run around the, the sanctuary or, or bark like a dog or, or laugh like a hyena or roll in the, the aisles, whatever is, is okay. And, and, and at the end of the day, usually later afternoon, when the service is finally done and the congregation goes home exhausted they go home exhausted but knowing that, that God is more pleased with their worship than any other worship in worshipville USA now when I was in school uh, I was told multiple times that the number one battle the church will fight within her own walls in the 21st century are the worship wars and this is true but I'm guessing that you will agree with me, though, this whole idea of worship, that whatever happens in here Sunday morning, this is the hub. And so this is like the thermostat for the whole church. And so what happens in here is going to influence the rest of, of the week. And so we have to get this worship question right I mean, there's just too much at stake. If, if we get this one wrong, and there are myriads of ways to get this one wrong, the, the ramifications can be eternally devastating. And so here's the question. What kind of worship most pleases God? Now, we want to answer this question. We want to say, what kind of worship most pleases me? I mean, that's, an, that's a question. But the real question, I think we all agree, is what kind of worship most pleases God. That's, that's the, the worship we need to be after. And, and so what we want to do this morning is we want to take a snapshot, a portrait of, of, of King David, perhaps the most defining event in his life to help him clarify, understand what type of worship most honors God. And as we do this, we want to ask ourselves, is that me? Is that us? And so, so if you turn with me in your Bibles or turn your Bibles on uh, to uh, 2 Samuel chapter 6. 2 Samuel 6. If you've got a pew Bible, look in front of you. I think it's page 298. But 2 Samuel 6. Beginning in verse 1. It says, David again brought together out of Israel chosen men, 30,000 in number. He and all his men set out from Bala of Judah to bring up from there the ark of God, which is called by the name, the name of the Lord Almighty, who is enthroned between the cherubim that are on the ark. Some of y'all are thinking, I know why he brought 30,000 people, because that ark is a big thing, man. It's got lots of animals and stuff in it. It takes 30,000 people to carry that deal. Wrong ark. Now, I, I know. <laughs> ark just means, it just means box. And so Noah's ark was really just a big box that, Hold stuff, right? This is the Ark of the Covenant, right? It's, it's, it's a much smaller, a much smaller box. Uh, you, you remember when Moses took the Israelites out of, out of Egypt, they stopped off at Sinai on their way to the Promised Land. By the way, I know you all know all about th this thing, but it's important for our, our story that we get some background fresh in our mind about the Ark of the Covenant. It was there at Mount Sinai that God gave a pretty elaborate uh, system for worshiping him. And this system included a, a tabernacle. It's a big te uh, tent. It was a portable deal with two rooms in it. The holy place that had only three pieces of furniture in it. A, a table with some bread on it and a uh, lamp stand and an altar of incense. We'll talk about that maybe some other time. But it has a back room uh, that people couldn't really get in. But the most sacred piece of furniture was in there. The most special piece of furniture. And that was the Ark of the covenant, they call it. And what it was is it was a, it was a probably a four, I think a four feet by two feet by two feet. It was about the size of you ever see those 
cedar chest that people push up to the back of their bed and put blankets in it, or maybe it's a hope chest or whatever. About that size, a little more elaborate. It's covered with gold and stuff. Of course, this is before there were hinges, and so they, they made a top that they just set on this thing, uh, gold, very elaborate, two big angels on, on top of it. The top they called the mercy seat, and, and this whole thing, in, inside the box, by the way, which is what gave the whole box any kind of significance, was the uh, Ten Commandments. Now, they put in different things at different points in their history, but, but the, the Ten Commandments, it was kind of like the, the, the wedding, uh, uh, wedding uh, license between God and Israel. It was, it, was, it was very, very, very important to them, that this Ten Commandments, as far as proving that God was for them and they were for God. This, this Ark of the, the, the Covenant carried that and ended up becoming reflective of God's presence itself. Exodus 25, we see, it says there, above the cover between the two cherubim that are now over the Ark of the Testimony, God says, I will meet with you and give you all of my commands for the Israelites. Notice that God's not in the box, a la Indiana Jones. He, he meets with them over the, the box. God's not, not confined in the box. He meets with them o- over the lid. But this thing, this Ark of the Covenant, is more than just a symbol for God's meeting with his people. It's the place God will meet with them. It's, it's huge. Remember, back there in the Garden of Eden, God created people... In the Garden of Eden, above everything else, or among everything else, it's a picture of the presence of God. When they're in the garden, they're with God. They got kicked out of the garden. They're they're not in God's presence anymore. But God deeply desires to be with his people. And so he came up with this idea of the the, the tabernacle. came up with the idea. That's kind of a uh, human way of talking about this, isn't it? But but, uh, this box, this Ark of the Covenant, God wanted to be with his folks, with his people. Now, you need to know this. It's a symbol, you can say that, of God's presence. But it's also a symbol of his transcendence, of his separation from people. Because this Ark of the Covenant was placed, remember, in the Holy of Holies, this back room where nobody could go. It was separated by a curtain from where the priests were, so no one could really be in there. God wanted to be with his people, but there was a difference between God and his, his people. And so, so this, this, this ark is, is so substantial that um, it stands for the holiness of God. Uh, it's dangerous. Matter of fact, God lets us know in Numbers, chapter 4, he says, they must not touch the holy things or they will die. Especially this, this ark, if you touched it, you died. Therefore, they, the rules for carrying this thing is they had poles that went through, they had little ringlets on it, and poles went through, and you carried it by the poles. You did not touch it, because if you did, you would die. Now, less than you think, these are stupid rules of God, random, irrelevant, who cares? God's on a power play. God's really trying to impress us. Stop. Think for a minute. If God wants to smash the earth and the entire cosmos, how big is the earth? It's, God does not need to try to impress us. He's not interested in that. Uh, there's a reason why he said you've got to carry this thing with the poles. Because the holiness of God is, is, is dangerous. Let's just say you're babysitting your, your child or your brother or the neighbor's kids or somebody. And that the toddler uh, looks at your electric stove and he goes up to it and you've got the heating element. It's on and it is glowing orange. And the toddler thinks this looks beautiful up there. Look at that. It's wonderful. It's intriguing. It's interesting. And he reaches for it. Now, you know something that toddler doesn't. Whoa! Hang back. and You know, he's not gonna, it's not going to just smart if he touches it. This could create real damage if he touches it. The, the, the holiness of God is like, like hot holiness. And if, if a wicked person, all of us, were to touch the hot holiness of God, we... we it would create incredible, incredible damage. And so God says, you can't do that. You just can't do that. Stay away. Stop. Don't go down, don't go down that road. And so um, history with, with the ark. Made underneath Moses' watch at Mount Sinai in 1450. 1375, they've taken over the promised land. And Joshua and these guys set up 
Shiloh is their capital. Jerusalem's not their capital, won't be their capital for like four or five hundred years. Shiloh is the capital. It's where the tabernacle is set up. And the ark stays there in the holy holies in Shiloh for about 400 years. Uh, 1075, Eli is the high priest. He's got a couple of boys. They aren't good guys. Hophni and Phinehas, they're not, they're not good guys. But they're assistant priests all the same because it's kind of a dynasty thing. One day they decide, you know, they're gonna, Israel's going into war with the Philistines. And they decide we're going to take the ark with us because the ark at this point is our good luck charm. It's our lucky rabbit's foot. And so they take the ark on the poles, take it on. They're going to go into war with it. Problem is they, they lose the battle. And the Philistines get the ark. And so the Philistines are like, yeah, 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 well, we got Israel's God. And they're just loving this. And so they take the ark back to the to, uh, Philistine area, Gath, their, their city. And, and they're, they're just excited about this until a plague breaks out in Gath. And the Philistine leaders are going, for crying out loud, this thing is a, is, is a bad luck charm. We don't need this thing. So they, they pass it on to another Philistine city. Why don't you guys watch this thing for a while? And so plague hits that city. Well, there are five key Philistine cities. The ark travels to all of them. Before you know it, the entire Philistine area is under a plague. And so the leaders get together and said, enough with this thing, man. Let's get rid of this deal. This is a bad scene. So they put it on a cart, hook up a couple of oxen. They point them towards Jerusalem, and they go, get out of here. And so they take off. Now, that the border city, border town of uh, Israel in the Philistine area is Beth Shemesh. And so these guys there in Beth Shemesh, they're out working in their fields, doing whatever they're doing. And all of a sudden they look up and crest the hill comes this ox cart one day. And as it gets a little bit closer, they notice it's got the Ark of the Covenant on it. And they're going, wow, we got our God back, yeah. You know, they're, again, they're thinking Philistine style. So they pull, get this thing up and they start talking amongst themselves going, you know, I've never really seen the ark up close before. I mean, it's, it's always carried on those poles by those priests way up front. And remember, say, but, but here, it's right here. My, my goodness. And one of them comes up with this brilliant idea. I'm told that the Ten Commandments are inside this box. The ones that, that God himself wrote, they're in here. Moses and, and 400 years ago, they're here. And the people, really? Well, I wonder if the Philistines took it out. Maybe we should check. And so the men at Beth Shemesh move the lid. They touch the holy things to look in to the, to the ark. Hmm. That doesn't go, doesn't go well for them. First Samuel 6, this is what happens. Uh, it says 19, but God struck down some of the men at Beth Shemesh, putting 70 of them to death because they looked into the ark of the Lord. The people mourned because of the heavy blow the Lord had dealt them. And the man of Beth Shemesh asked, who can stand in the presence of the Lord, this, this holy God, to whom will the ark go up from here? They're trying to get rid of it just like the Philistines. Let's get rid of this thing, right? So then they sent messengers to the people of Kiriath-Jarim, saying, the Philistines have returned the ark of the Lord. Come down and take it up to your place. So the men of Kiriath-Jerim came, and they took up the ark of the Lord, and they took it to Abinadab's house on the hill, in case you wondered where Abinadab lived, and consecrated Eliezer, his son, to guard the ark of the Lord. Now, the, the ark of the covenant hangs out in Abinadab's garage for 20 years before Saul, King Saul, comes on the throne. Then Saul is going to reign 40 years. But you know what? Saul never goes to get the ark doesn't care about the ark. And this is a huge indictment on Saul for a couple of reasons. First of all, Deuteronomy 17 lets us know that when the king comes in to play, the first thing the king's supposed to do is write down a copy of the law and read it day and night, which is, you know, the first five books of the Bible, or maybe just Deuteronomy, but still read it every night. If, if Saul would have done that, he would have known the significance of the ark. He would have done something about it. But Saul either blew off God's word or Saul just didn't care. One of the two. Think about this for a minute. God wants to be with his people so bad. We're, we're talking God. God's kind of big, right? He wants to be with his people so bad that he gives this picture, the ark. Is, it's his presence. And the people take it and they stick it in a garage for 60 years where it gathers dust, where some guy's little boy, Eliezer, watches this thing. I mean, if someone 
If you gave a gift to somebody that was your heart, you love them so much, maybe it's a picture of you, right? You give to them, and they take it out and hang it in the garage, you're going to feel a little upset. Worse if they hang it in someone else's garage, right? Oh, my, my goodness. So here, here's, here's God. He, God is offering to be with his people, but Saul doesn't care. Saul's not concerned. Now David, on the other hand, as soon as Saul's out of the picture, he dies. After David gets things stabilized, very first thing David does, goes and gets the ark. Now what that tells us, is David has never seen the ark before. He's never seen it in worship before. But it tells us he's read the word of God. He knows it's significant. And he also must have inquired because he knows that it's at Benadab's house on the hill in kiriath Jerim. He knows because he goes right there. He's been following this thing. And so he, he, he knows, I've got to get the ark. And getting the ark, David learns the worship that's acceptable to God. Uh, verse, well, first Chronicles 13. You don't have to turn there. It's on the, on the screen, though, it should be. David organizes a parade. It says, David conferred with each of his officers, the commanders of thousands, the commanders of hundreds, and he said to the whole assembly of Israel, if it seems good to you and if it is the will of the Lord our God, let us send word far and wide to the rest of our brothers throughout the territories of Israel and also to the priests and Levites who are with them in their towns and pasture lands to come and join us. Let us bring the ark of our God back to us. For we did not inquire of it during the reign of Saul. The whole assembly agreed to do this because it seemed right to all the people. So they organized this huge parade. I mean, they've got people from all Israel are coming in for this thing. This is a big, big deal when they bring up this ark. This is a massive thing. Psalm 68 talks about this, this very, very procession. And so they've, they've got this deal going. This big parade is happening. It's going to be exciting. Everyone's pumped about it. And he goes, verse 3 of 2 Samuel 6. They set the ark of God on a new cart and brought it from the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, were guiding the new cart with the ark of God on it. And Ahio was walking the front of it. Uh, that would mean that Uzzah was behind it, right? David and the whole house of Israel were celebrating with all their might before the Lord with songs and with harps and lyres, tambourines, sistrums, and cymbals. Let me ask you, do you think these folk were sincere in their worship? I, no reason for us to not think that. This was very organized. This wasn't like a spur-of-the-moment thing. This was a major, major deal. All these guys that come in, it's a huge... Do you think that perhaps they were celebrating... With all their might, it says that, so I would guess that's probably true. I mean, they weren't there 50%. They weren't there in their body, but not their mind. No, no, they were there 100%. They were really celebrating. So what happens next is, is confusing a little bit. When they came to the threshing floor of Nacon, Uzzah reached out and took hold of the ark of God because the oxen stumbled. Uzzah did what probably you and I would have done if we were right there. The, the hit a pothole or the axe and stumble and the thing starts sliding and it's going to fall off and it's going to hit the mud and immediately just, just got to protect the ark, right? So he, he tries to protect it. But the Lord's anger burned against Uzzah because of his irreverent act. Therefore, God struck him down and he died there beside the ark of God. Yes, well, God, what are you doing? I mean, Uzzah had no, he wasn't trying to hurt the ark, right? He was a good guy. Was he trying to protect it? I mean, Uzzah was, was, was David's friend, and he was probably a husband and maybe a father, so there are probably he has children that are now not going to have a dad. You know, what's amazing is Uzzah's father was Abinadab, the guy who had the house on the hill. Uh, so Uzzah grew up not able to put his bike in the garage because that dumb ark was in the garage for the last 60 years. Uzzah knew the ark better than anybody else. He, he had sacrificed more for the ark more than anybody else. And God is going to strike. Don't you think, God, you're just being just a little bit picky and snickety here? He's just trying to protect it. Come on now. Someone, how about sincerity? Doesn't that worth anything? And David, David's struggling with this. Next verse, 8, David was angry because of the Lord's wrath. David gets ticked off at, who do you think David's ticked off at? Uh, he's ticked off at God. He, because it had broken out against Uzzah. 
And to this day, the place is called Perez Uzzah, which is outbreak against Uzzah. David was afraid of the Lord that day and said, how can the ark of the Lord ever come to me? He was not willing to take the ark of the Lord to be with him in the city of David, which is Jerusalem. Instead, he took it aside to the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. So next exit, get off. Stick it in the garage of the first house they find. You know, it's, this, this thing is like traveling the, the, the neighborhood. Obed-Edom's garage, man. This guy's a Gittite, not even an Israelite. You hang on to this thing. We're done. Now, isn't this typical of us? God acts in a way we don't think he should act. God does something. Could not have God prevented? It does, it's not just an issue of God could have prevented Uzzah from getting hurt. God is the author of Uzzah getting hurt. It makes you say, God, you're going to act in a way I don't understand Forget it. I'm done. You go hang out with Obed-Edom for a while, okay? Because I am done with you. I'm not, not following you anymore. Don't we do this all the time? God does something we don't understand, we don't expect, we don't, we don't think in our logic it makes sense. We're done. We're done with God. We're done with God. David was there. Uh, here's the, here's the, the, the lesson of Uzzah. The lesson of Uzzah is worship without obedience is dangerous. Worship without obedience is dangerous. Now think about the irony here for just a second. The, the Ark of the Covenant, the only reason it was important is because the covenant, the Ten Commandments, God's word is inside it. And by them bringing this thing back, what they're saying is, we really missed your word. We want to honor your word. We're going to obey your word. We're going to do your word, God. And while they're making this big hullabaloo about, about God's word, they're disobeying it. They're not carrying it on the poles like God's word has stipulated it's supposed to be. They, uh, what they're thinking is God is uh, nice. He's my national flag. He's my Statue of Liberty. Uh, he's a, an icon. He's something we can put on the coins, put in our pledge. God is, is our mascot. You know, God's my mascot. He's Israel's mascot. And God's reminding him here, he's not their mascot. Why, why do you think Uzzah died? Think about this for a second. He did not die because they put the ark on a cart. He died because he touched the ark, and he touched the ark because it was on a cart. My, let me say that again. Don't be confused. Think this. Oh. He didn't die because the ark was on a cart. He died because he t- touched it. And the only reason he touched it is because it wasn't being carried with the poles. It was on the cart. Now, we think sometimes that God's rules are snickety. They're random. They're useless. They make no sense. They're stupid things. But we need to know that, that God's Law for us, God's rules for us, are, are not the random things. They're not to hurt us. They're there to protect us. If they, would have been, if they would have been carrying this thing the way God said, carrying it, it wouldn't have almost fallen. Uzzah wouldn't have, have had to try to stop it. What, what this lets us know is it doesn't matter who your daddy is. If your daddy is Barack Obama or Tom Brady or El Capone or Billy Graham, if you're a toddler and you reach up and you touch the hot stove, it doesn't care who your dad is, does it? It doesn't care how nice or sweet or wonderful or how many good things you've done. If you reach up and touch that hot stove, you're in trouble. If, in fact, we violate God's word, that that is what God's letting us know. That's that's the whole idea with this thing. And uh, when we come for us, when we come to worship, and we go to church, and we... uh, Experience God feelings, maybe it felt good. We uh, experience, uh, sing God songs, but really, we're not interested in obeying him. Oh, no, no. I, I've got my, my, my stuff I've got to do at work, my boss is making me do, or you know, I have to do to keep my job or stay ahead or whatever. Else. It's not really matching with God's word, but oh well. But I'm going to still come to church and sing, song, but I'm going to not obey him. Or I've got my boyfriend or girlfriend, and I'm going to do whatever I kind of we really want to do, regardless of what God says. We'll still come to church and kind of worship and sing, sing songs, but we're not interested in obeying him. Or, you know, I've got my, uh, uh, I know I shouldn't slander people. I know I shouldn't gossip about folk and talk about them, but you know what? I'm going to do it anyway. I, don't, I really don't care. Or I should be generous. I know I should with my, my money, but it's my money. I don't, I'm going to come and feel the God feelings and worship, but I'm not going to be. 
God says, listen, listen, worship without obedience is dangerous. God is not interested in a worship parade unless it's attended by folk who deeply desire to be obedient, who desire to serve him. There, there are uses here today, you know, because there are uses every time God's people come together to worship him. So how about you? Is your middle name maybe Uzzah? Because you're hanging on to... Not, we're not talking about not being perfect. We're talking about hanging on to something you know is wrong and you're going to plan on doing it anyway. It's Uzzah. It's dangerous. Is it possible to feel the, the God feelings and sing the God songs and still be under the displeasure of God? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Don't let your emotion trick you. David goes home with this. You know, they've got the ark is hanging out in Obed-Edom's garage now. And David goes home, and he starts studying. He starts looking at Scripture, and he starts thinking. He starts wondering, and he realizes what they did wrong. And so he, he, he organizes parade number two, worship parade number two. Verse 13. It says, when those, so this whole thing is happening again. It's, it's, you know, worship, pray, take two, let's go. When those who were, as I read this, as you read it, notice the differences between this parade and the last one. When those who were carrying the ark of the Lord had taken six steps, he sacrificed a bull and a fattened calf. David, wearing a linen ephod, danced before the Lord with all his might, while he and the entire, and by the way, David was in good shape, so I can imagine what that dance might have looked like, while he and the entire house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouts and the sound of trumpets. First thing, they're carrying it, right? They're, when they was carrying the ark, we see that difference. Okay, they're doing it correct. The sacrifices, that was never commanded. But what's really cool about this is they're celebrating, right, with all their might. However, they're stopping to recognize the deep holiness of God. They're stopping to recognize my utter sinfulness and and inability to be with them. That's why we have to, to sacrifice. And yet, at the same time, they're having a good time. They are celebrating with all their might. You've got David wearing a linen ephod. Now, normally David would be wearing his kingly uh, robes. He would be sitting on an elevated throne that is carried. But, but he's not going to be elevated today. Nobody but God. He would be wearing his general's outfit with his medals all polished. He'd have his armor on and a sword by his side. But he stripped all of that. And this ephod is just like a, a long, uh, plain uh, linen t-shirt. It's as it's, it's humble of a, of, of a clothing you could put on. David is wearing this. He's not exalted today, just God. And, and he's dancing. You know, only people who dance were really the women. When the guys would come back from battle, the gals would come out and dance. David is dancing. We're going to find out that David wasn't just dancing with the servants. David was dancing with the servants' children. The king, David. And, and so David, maybe as they're pulling into Jerusalem, David's hoping that his, his wife, Michael, would join him in the dance. But uh, Michael was a no-show at the worship parade. Uh, verse 16, as the ark, the Lord was entering the city of David, Michael, the daughter of Saul, notice it doesn't say Michael, the wife of David, but the daughter of Saul, watched from a window. And when she saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, she despised him in her heart. You know, those who have no reason to dance often despise those who do. Right? Now, Michael, she, 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 was, she was a queen. She couldn't be bothered with a stupid thing like a worship parade for crying out loud. She had important things to do. I mean, she, maybe the servant's schedules needed to be set. Maybe her royal hair needed to be fixed. You know, her royal nails needed to be taken care of. She had important things. Besides, Michael's gifts were not in dancing. They were in discernment. And so she pulled up a chair to the window. She was... In a sense, she was at the worship parade that day. She was, though, not as a participant, but as an observer. She was observing the worship parade. And so David, he's had a great time. It was was a wonderful day. No one died. It was a great deal. They got the ark in town. Everyone's excited. He he, he treats all the people, uh, some, some eats. It was a great day. Verse 20, when David returned home to bless his household, he thinks maybe it's just going to be a great day at home too. He doesn't know this is going on in Michael's heart. He's about to find out. Michael, daughter of Saul, came out to meet him. 
not again, not wife of David, and said, how the king of Israel has distinguished himself today, disrobing in the sight of the slave girls of his servants, as any vulgar fellow would. Says, oh, David, 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 David. You're so, you're so, you're so uh, uh, useless, pathetic. What kind of a king are you? And she's ready to rip into him and let him know what, what royalty is supposed to be. See, Michael was a, a princess. She grew up in Saul's palace. She, she knew palace protocol. She knew how royalty was supposed to act. She, she knew how image control was key in Michael's life. Her daddy taught her. She knew how to make this work. And so she's ready to lay into David with some more counsel. But David shuts her down. In verse 21, David said to Michael, It was before the Lord who chose me rather than your father or anyone from his house when he appointed me ruler over the Lord's people Israel. I will celebrate before the Lord. He says, Michael, hang on a second, clueless Michael. If I'm not mistaken, that dynasty that you're talking about with this, the image control thing, the, the not wanting to be uh, considered uh, uh, immature by the people, if I'm not mistaken, God rejected that dynasty, that way of doing life, and instead chose me over that, that dynasty. I will celebrate. And then he goes on to say, and Michael, you ain't seen nothing yet. Uh, verse 21, I will become even more undignified than this, and I will be humiliated in my own eyes, but by these slave girls you spoke of, I will be held in honor. Now, the, the lesson of Michael is that worship without participation is deceptive. Is, isn't it? I mean, there are Michaels here today. There are Michaels every time God's people gather to worship. They're not participants. They're, they're observers. They've got the gift of discernment. They pull the chair up, and they are quick to be critical about you know, the critical of the music, critical of the pastor, critical of the elders, the ushers, critical of the guy who put together the bulletin, critical, critical. That, that's, that's, that's Michael. Not participating in worship. Lots of reasons why not to. Okay. Now, there are other Michaels here today who perhaps you feel the call of the wild, kind of the Holy Spirit, and you want to participate sometime. But you're just afraid. What will the people think of me? What will others think? I will look, I will look, uh, uh, I will be humiliated in their eyes. They're gonna, they're gonna associate me with some goofy people. And so you need to know you, when you worship God, you can't be concerned about what God thinks and concerned about what people think. You choose. And if you're concerned most about what people think, then guess who you're worshiping? Yourself. Uh, genuine worship is a worship for the audience of one, regardless of what anybody thinks, what anyone's about. You know, I think of my, myself, I think of FAC, and I wonder, what would it be like if there was a church where the vast majority of the folk who came worshipped in spirit and in truth, they worshiped with devotion and with obedience. They worshiped concern. I'm going to honor God with my life, not just when I'm in this place. I'm going to obey him, and I'm going to live my life for the audience of him alone. What could God do with a church like that? You know, I, I believe that that, uh, that true worship is the, the greatest evangelism uh, technique that's out there. It's the greatest discipleship tool that's out there. Can God use us in that regard? Oh, man. Uh, years ago, D.L. Moody said this. And I, this is my favorite D.L. Moody quote. It says, The world has yet to see what God can do through a man totally committed to him. And then you've got to love this last line. Moody says, By God's grace, I will be that man uneducated, simple D.L. Moody puts together a school that has sent more missionaries to the foreign field than any other school out. He, not just, not, he wasn't just used to revolutionize Chicago, but, but to impact villages, countries overseas. This one man. 
I wonder if we could say this. I wonder if we could say, just change the words a little bit and say, the world has yet to see what God can do through a church totally committed to him. And then, got to use this next line. By God's grace, we will be that church.